this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others' trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, once again we come and stand before your word, before your truth, seeking truth for our lives. Speak, for we listen. Amen. So today we continue our four-part series considering the Lord's Prayer. We began last week and will continue through the month of February looking at this well-known prayer, probably one of the most well-known parts of the Christian worship service, considering this thing that so many of us know so well that we can recite it pretty much without thinking about it. So, we're thinking about it a bit this month. Last week we talked that there are four parts of the prayer, and we're essentially taking one part per week. Last week we talked about the address beginning of the prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Who are we praying to? This week we're going to look at the your petitions. Next week the us petitions, and then we'll finish with the doxology. So this week we consider your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You've got the little cheat sheet in your bulletin. Which I'll mention when we do the prayers of the people a little later on. This is the version we'll be using. So, there you go. You've been forewarned. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If the Lord's Prayer begins with identifying who it is we are addressing, who it is we are speaking to, then the prayer gets into the meat of it right away by asking what we would wish for our world. Your kingdom come. Perhaps it's obvious, but I think it bears mentioning here, that when we pray that God's kingdom would come, we are praying that God's kingdom would come, not our kingdom or the kingdom of the world, or the kingdom of any particular worldly ruler or power. Now some people have a problem or a challenge with kingdom and kingship language in the scripture. They say, you know, haven't we moved beyond this idea of God as a king? Isn't that an earthly image? Maybe. But we do know that the author of Matthew wraps the idea of God's kingdom already here, but not yet here, is woven throughout the gospel. Over two dozen times, Matthew speaks of the coming kingdom of God, or the coming kingdom of heaven. And kingdom language was used by Jesus' disciples, was used by most of the people Jewish community to refer to the reign of God, a time when worldly powers would no longer hold sway. This is especially poignant for those living under Roman rule, the rule of a far-off king who cared little for the well-being of the people in that area, and so for God's kingdom to come is a great wish. But there's also a dual promise and a dual request in this petition that God's kingdom would come. There is a future promise that is central to the Gospel of Matthew, that God will eventually rule in all corners of the world, that God's love and power and truth will supplant all those things that seek 
by us. But there's also a present reality. Praying for God's kingdom to come is not some wishful thinking. It is not saying, someday it would be nice if this were to happen. It is saying, God, may I work for the coming of God's kingdom in the here and now. In Matthew, kingdom is expressed not just as a future hope, but a present reality. That we experience the kingdom of God not in some eschatological end of the world way, but in the covenant community in which we find ourselves here and now. So when we pray in the Lord's Prayer for God's kingdom to come, for your kingdom to come, it is implicating ourselves in that work. It is saying, God, I will do the work for your kingdom to be known in this place, in this time. We then say, your will be done. Again, I think it's important to say, your will, not my will. Because how often does my will Miss the mark, shall we say. So what is God's will? What does God will for us and for God's people? You know, I had a bit of a hard time with that one. I was trying to decide, well, okay, this, this is logic of what's God's will. Hmm. What does a pastor say about God's will for the world? And so I have a theological answer then maybe one that's a little less theological. The theological answer is God's will is, a, is expressed in the law and the prophets. We see God's will in the Ten Commandments, the laws of Moses, the teachings of the Old Testament. And that, theologically, is enough to say that. But I think there's more. And maybe it's even simpler to say that God's will is when God's kingdom comes. When God's kingdom comes, when we live in right relationships with one another. When we live in right relationships with God. When we seek the welfare of the least of these in our community. When we reach out to that person that, you know, we'd really rather not because it's just easier that way. God's will is done when we seek the ways of love, the ways of reconciliation, the ways of hope. God's will is done when we take care of ourselves. Because Jesus commands us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And truth as I read it express, I'm, I'm, I'm diving in to a book by Thomas Merton. If you have not read Thomas Merton, he was a Trappist monk in the hills of Kentucky who wrote beautifully of seeing the beauty of creation shining through those around him. And in the beginning of this work, No Man is an Island, he, he talks how we cannot love others if we hate ourselves. For the hatred we feel towards ourselves is what we're going to show to the world. And conversely, if we hate the world, we cannot love ourselves. It's only by holding others and ourself in unity and feeling that sense of purpose and care that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew has this idea of already but not yet. It is one of the great dichotomies of our faith that we proclaim that God's will is done in heaven. It's already done there. Our world has rebelled. Sin has driven us apart from one another and from God. And 
so God's will is not always done here on earth. Once again, this prayer is not future hope. This is not, God, I hope that someday your will is done. And it stops there. To pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven means to embrace the hope of the coming kingdom and to embrace work that we do in this church and in this community and with one another is not separate from our theological <laughs> understanding of scripture. We cannot take the Bible and relegate it to the classroom or to the pulpit. We can't take theology and relegate it to the seminary or the theologian. It all ties together. Because how we view God impacts how we view one another. And how we pray to and about and for God is how we pray to, about, and for one another. If our creator is some distant deity to be pleased by our worship, to be placated by our gifts, and so is the rest of humanity. But if we turn to a God who is more closely connected to each of us than we could ever understand, if we see God as the creative force that turned nothing into beauty, then we can't help but pray for God's kingdom to come. We can't help but pray for God's will to be done. Because then earth will be as it is in heaven. That, my friends, is a beautiful vision indeed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.